And I'm actually going to be talking about precision medicine, but of a very different kind, the kind of precision medicine that inherits from a view of the brain as an inference machine making sense of its world and what can go wrong in psychiatric and neurological disorders. So I've only got 15 minutes, so all I'm going to be able to do is to communicate to you the excitement about three foundational ideas um, that underwrite this emerging field of computational psychiatry. Um, just to sketch the ideas, and crucially, just to highlight how they relate to each other and how we can leverage certain insights from clinical psychiatry in devising ways of looking at the brain during its sense-making. So I'm going to be talking about uh, synaptic disconnections, a breaking down of connectivity in the brain as the physiological basis of um, certain psychiatric and neurological disorders, and then try to understand what that means for the brain as the organ of sentient behavior that makes sense of our world and chooses what to do next, and then briefly just touch upon how this can inform non-invasive new ways of measuring the brain in action uh, and hopefully can then be applied in the context of precision medicine. So the basic idea is this. If it's the case that I can convince you that all of psychology, namely action, cognition and perception, corresponds to a form of inference, inferring abductively what's going on out there in the world and what am I going to do about it, then it follows that psychopathology corresponds to false inference. And I mean that in a very straightforward way. The kind of false inference that you would make as a statistician inferring something is not there when it is. So this would be a good metaphor for certain neglect syndromes. Syndromes where people believe something is not there when, it's, when it is actually present. For example, uh, I don't have, I can't feel my right arm, doc, or I can't, uh, it is not my arm. Alternatively, you may be inferring things are there when they're not. So this would be a nice metaphor for the false inference that underlies hallucinations and delusions. Um, the mechanisms I'm going to appeal to um, that underwrite this kind of false inference are failure to encode the precision of beliefs. So I'm using precision now in a very different context. Precision is the inverse of uncertainty. It's the inverse variability. So what we're going to see in this story is that the way that we encode our uncertainty about our beliefs has a profound effect on our sense-making and what we believe about the world and our responses to it. Uh, specifically, um, from the point of view of a computational neuroscientist, aberrant precision um, is going to be the story or the cause of mental disorders uh, in functional terms, and that's going to translate into aberrant neuromodulation in terms of pathophysiology and pharmacology. But let me flesh out that, uh, that sort of story using schizophrenia as a worked example. What I've done here is just write down some of the symptoms and signs of uh, schizophrenia, uh, making the point that nearly all the phenology of psychosis, uh, including delusions, um, hallucinations, and thought disorders, can all be construed as some kind of false belief updating or false inference in the sense of delusions being uh, beliefs about the world that are not true, hallucination being false inferences about what's out there causing my sensations, false percepts, um, and more subtle forms of failures of inference and belief updating in terms of disintegration of the, our mental life and our psyche. Um, indeed, if you think about it, nearly all of neurological and psychiatric symptoms and experience can be cast in terms of some form of abnormal belief updating and false inference. I've just listed a few here in terms of false beliefs about my body, uh, false beliefs about whether I exist, am I a person, it, uh, obsessional thoughts, compulsive thoughts, and, and, so on, and so on. From the point of view of a psychopharmacologist or somebody trying to understand the physiology that might underwrite false belief updating or false inference, I've just written down here 
some of the um, more favorite hypotheses about what might cause things like psychosis and schizophrenia uh, in terms of a failure of how neurons talk to each other, synaptic integration, um, and in particular the neurotransmitters, the chemicals involved in the communication between nerve cells mediated by uh, synaptic connections. Uh, I've listed a few of the people's favorite neurotransmitters and uh, neurotransmitter hypotheses here in terms of the dopamine hypothesis, glutamate, and GABAergic hypothesis. The point I just want to make here is that there's one cross-cutting theme to all these apparently diverse hypothetical mechanisms that have been brought to the table to explain abnormal functional integration, belief updating in the brain of people with psychosis. They all involve aberrant neuromodulation. So neuromodulation here is not the f a failure of neurons or brain cells talking to each other, but a failure of the gain control, the coordination, the, um, the contextualization, the influence that this neuron has on this neuron here. So it's a subtle effect, but a really important effect, and speaks to two different flavors of the disconnection that's implicit in a failure of modulatory, modulating contextualizing, coordinating the integration of different parts of our brain. Um, most famously illustrated by uh, Wernicke and his notions of subjunction, where basically you can think about this as the explanation for the, for the disconnections that undergird psychosis and other neurological conditions as a, a, a cutting of the wires that connect different parts of the brain and do the functional integration uh, within the brain as opposed to a more subtle explanation um, offered by uh, Bloiler in terms of a disintegration of the psyche, uh, a failure uh, to, of coordinated activity that can be read really not as a cutting of the wires, but a failure of the transistors and the gain controls in say a wiring circuit uh, metaphor for our brains. And it's really this that I want to focus on and try to understand it in terms of what would that look like if I was not able to control the excitability of my brain cells to their inputs? What would that look like in terms of my sense making and my behavior? And for that, we're going to briefly rehearse the, um, the second big idea, which is active inference predictive coding and the key role of precision in this formulation of sense making um, in a constructive organ, the brain, a brain that can be read as an organ of inference, sense-making. I think um, beautifully illustrated by this 16th century oil painter here. So he was famed for painting still lives. But if you look at this from another perspective, you get a very different explanation, a very different hypothesis for what generated that pattern of sensory impressions. So if previously you saw a bowl of fruit, but now you see a face. The key point is that you made that face. That's come from the inside out as a, an explanation and a hypothesis that explains the causes of these sensory impressions. So this notion that the brain is a constructive organ, an organ of inference, trying to find the best explanations for what caused uh, these sensory impressions. Um, this idea has been around since the students of Plato, I think most compellingly and beautifully articulated by uh, Helmholtz, for example. Objects are always imagined as being present in the field of vision, as would have to be there in order to produce the same impression on the nervous system. So again, he's speaking to this sort of constructive inside-out approach to sense-making and perception. So it's not the case that it's an outside-in sensory information impresses itself on the brain and somehow information expressions are extracted. It's much more a question of finding the explanations. And this clearly is very closely related to the notions of Richard Gregory, for example, where perception just is hypothesis testing, seeing whether these sensations match what you would have predicted if you'd guessed right what was going on. So these ideas have been used to great effect um, throughout statistics, um,
quantum physics and indeed machine learning. Uh, so for example, Jeffrey Hinton and Peter Diam actually brought to machine learning the notion of a Helmholtz machine um, uh, as a sort of formalization of the Bayesian brain, borrowing from the uh, probability theory of uh, Thomas Bayes and um, the uh, formulations, the mechanics uh, of uh, Richard Feynman. Let's just come back to this notion, an impression on the nervous system. So the idea here is that the outside world, beyond the skull, is producing sensations, shadows on our sensory veil, that we have to make sense of by saying, what caused that? What's the best explanation for that? And the, um, the sort of formalism that we get, both from Richard Feynman and um, implementations of those ideas in machine learning and artificial intelligence, um, is the notion of predictive coding. So what do I mean by predictive coding? Well, uh, I've written that down mathematically up there for those people who like the maths. It's just telling you about the rate of change of some expectations about what caused this sensory shadow that can be decomposed into some prediction. If I know what's out there, I know how it changes. That is then corrected by an update term that depends upon a prediction error weighted by its precision. So what's prediction error? Well, imagine that we have this sensory shadow uh, on our eyes or on our retina. And I had some expectation that it was a dog that was causing this pattern of sensory input. Then if I had a generative model that could generate the sensations that I would get if this expectation was correct, then I can generate those predictions, compare them with the sensations, and then form a prediction error, a mismatch signal. And all this equation is saying is that the prediction error is, can then be used to update my expectations and explain the prediction error away. So I'm suppressing and resolving the prediction error and in so doing, finding the best explanation for this pattern of sensory inputs. Now notice in minimizing the prediction error, I will never know what actually caused my sensations, but that doesn't matter. If I can get through my life by minimizing prediction error, job done, that's, that's good enough. Um, so I've highlighted the precision here and its key role in mediating the influence of our prediction errors on our belief updating the rate of change of our expectations. Um, the reason I've done that um, is that this view of the brain as a prediction error minimizing machine gracefully explains the intimate relationship between perception and action because I can resolve my prediction errors in one of two ways. I can either literally change my mind to make my predictions more like my sensations, and we can refer to that as perception, or we can change our sensations to make them more like the predictions. So how would you change your sensations? Well, literally by palpating the world in a different way, sampling different data, either moving your eyes, literally sampling data from Google or Wikipedia. Um, you are in charge of the data that is the basis of your sense making. Uh, and basically what this story says is that we always will sample the world in order to try and fulfill our predictions. But there's a key question that arises. How are you going to minimize prediction error, either by changing your mind or changing the data that you're sampling? Well, this is where the precision can come in. Uh, and it's, uh, it so transpires that if I want to act, I basically have to uh, not change my mind about acting, and therefore, effectively, I have to ignore the prediction errors that would normally drive my belief updating. And this is known as sensory attenuation. It's attenuating the precision, reducing the gain or the influence of prediction errors on my belief updating so that I can act. Um, just to show you how potent that mechanism is and how much we take for granted in terms of this delicate balance between uh, moving and sense-making through belief updating, I just want to play a little game with you. Oh, I'm red. Good grief. <laughs> right. <laughs> Can I just play this game and then we'll rush through the remainder? <laughs> we have traffic lights here. This is, the Tolo has proved you can survive even through red. Um, I, haven't got, I haven't got her courage to do that. <laughs> but I do want to play this game for you and just show, show you another, an, a, another, and then I'll rush through the remainder of the slides and show you what you would have seen had I uh, kept on time. The game is, um, I'm, in a moment, what's going to happen is that Sherlock Holmes is going to jump from here to here. 
and it's a change detection task. So your job is to tell me whether anything about Sherlock Holmes changed or not in his transit from the left to the right of the screen. Um, there's go I'm going to ask all the women in the audience to fixate on the central cross and just attend to Sherlock Holmes and see if Sherlock Holmes changed. Conversely, all the men in the audience, are, you, I would like you to track and follow Sherlock Holmes and see which, whether it's the men or the women, are able to detect any change should it occur. So I'm going to count down and Sherlock Holmes is going to jump. Women fixate on the central cr cross, men follow the uh, follow Sherlock Holmes. So here we go, three, two, one. Right, let's ask a man. You, sir, did, did Sherlock Holmes change? You think, in what way? Ah, that's probably correct, actually. It's not quite the answer I was searching for. <laughs> I had to fiddle because we were forced to do a six to nine ratio PowerPoint. Um, <laughs> any, any other, uh, 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 ask, well, let's, let's ask, ask a woman. Um, uh, um, Christina, did, did Sherlock Holmes change or not? What message? <laughs> did any of the men see a message? What was the message? There's no message. <laughs> Excellent. That worked quite well. Um, so the idea here is because the, uh, the women were not moving, they were not subject to sensory attenuation, and so they could process the message, did you miss me, from Moriarty. The men, on the other hand, were actually actively resampling and tracking the visual scene. So they were attenuating, they were decreasing the gain of their sensory prediction errors and were basically unable to attend and even see the message. So what this shows you is your brain is hardwired to um, contextualize and switch on, on, on and off the precision on a very, very fine time scale in a way that is intimately related to the way that we actively gather information uh, in order to make sense of what's going on out there. Um, if we'd had time, I would have shown you um, the implications of this for um, um, perception and how it can go wrong uh, in a hierarchical context. The, um, the idea here is that the same kind of mechanism and, and getting the gain or the neuromodulation right um, has an enormous impact on what we perceive. Uh, so this is the, uh, um, the final sort of, if you like, participatory um, illustration here. So in, 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 this is meant to illustrate the role of precision at different levels of hierarchical, what's called predictive coding or, or inference. So if I had asked you to look at this, and you may have two hypotheses. It's caused by um, some pebbles or some coins, and you would um, have some expectations or beliefs or some uncertainty about that. But if I gave you another hypothesis, another high-level explanation for what caused this pattern of sensory inputs, then I will be increasing the precision of certain beliefs at a high level in your visual hierarchies. That means you can't unsee it. And the story would have been, imagine what it would be like if you could never unsee all of these things. You, everything you looked at was you tried to make sense of in terms of faces or voices or narratives that just weren't there, simply because you couldn't adjust the precision right. And that would be basically the story. And then I would have gone on to uh, motivate ways of um, measuring this precision or gain control non-invasively in children using uh, something called uh, dynamic causal modeling um, and give you an intuition as to how it can work and some provisional um, electrophysiological evidence in uh, small animal models and just tell you that this kind of technology is now being deployed at least in the experimental context of epilepsy uh, in the context of the Human Brain Project, an EU-wide um, uh, approach to computational uh, psych neuroscience, but uh, in this instance in the service of uh, a computational psychiatry or neurology of epilepsy. And then I would be thanking you and everybody else helping. Oh, I've gone green. I've done it. I made, I made it through the other way. Yes.